Morning Talk with Siki Mgabadeli. Siki Mgabadeli. On SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader, talking about Robert Sobukwe this morning, a documentary titled Sobukwe, A Great Soul, is going to be broadcast on the 20th of March and the 27th of March um, at 9 p.m. on SABC1. And we're going to hear from you this morning about his life, his impact on South Africa and his impact on the liberation struggle. The number to dial 08 911 SMS is to 347 one in conversation with the Tamiga Blackie, who's a deputy chairperson of the SABC board, also a participant in the documentary series. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much, ma'am. You know, uh, the SABC and I think the media in general is often uh, accused of being one-sided in its coverage and that it doesn't often acknowledge other key players in, in the liberation struggle. So would you say that's one of the things that motivated this particular documentary? I think it did. And uh, if I may just trace, there's some background to this uh, project. Uh, the SABC board, led by Christina Kunta, some four or five years ago, to be precise, uh, commissioned this uh, documentary. Mm. It, uh, it also dealt with other uh, characters and figures that needed to be spoken to and whose lives needed to be exposed. I think there was the other follow-up parts had to do with Chris Hani. Mm. There was a part that had to do with Winnie Mandela, etc., etc., etc. So this was a package that they, they then bought a creed upon in order to try to to close this gap about the paucity of historical material, i.e. in respect to Sobukwe and many other unsung heroes mm. and unsung leaders. So, we, true to form, uh, Miki and uh, Caroline were assigned to do this task, and I must say they've done themselves proud. They've outdone themselves, the documentary, I've seen copies of it, I've yeah. gone through it. Excellent piece of work. We're going to be proud of the outcome and the product that is coming forward. And my question is that it sh- must and should be available even to schools, yeah. to young kids in the communities, to get to understand who we were and where we come from. Let's talk a little bit about, I mean, you were one of the participants um, in the documentary. What were they looking for from you? Well, four years ago, even before I became uh, associated with the SABC, I was uh, called by Miki uh, simply because he was advised that I was busy with the book on Sobukwe. Mm. It's a book that I've been busy with uh, for the past six, seven years because it has been an onerous task to to unpack and to try to get as much material on Sobukwe as possible. It was on that insistence that we had a meeting. It came down to Vanderbilt Park with discussions. In order to have a sense of the material that I had and expose them to the library and files and files and files of interviews that I've conducted so many people and they were interested to rope me in as many other people like John uh, Mlambo, many other stalwarts to speak and to talk about Sobukwe. But mine was more of an academic input into the life of Sobukwe and to close some historical gaps which are prevalent particularly in the only only book on Sobukwe by Pokrant. Mm, many, many yeah. gaps exist in that book, which I thought, and I thought it was behooving us as intellectuals, especially African activists, to close those gaps and to speak and to write a proper story in Sobuk. We'll talk a little bit about those historical <coughs> gaps, but you use the term onerous task to do the research. And one of the things I said was that there is not a single piece of archive, not a single piece of surviving audio recording of this this man, who you was know, probably one of the most recorded. How is that possible? This is a, this is a tragedy about us. Africans in general, we do not have possession of material on our own leaders. Even to their lifetime, their lifetime, we don't preserve mm. uh, their stories. We don't preserve their lives. Uh, in the case of Sobukwe, one, there's no uh, audiovisual footage wow. on Sobukwe. This is a man who died in 1978, uh, just after 76 uprisings. But there's nothing, no audiovisual. And he has been visited by the regime in Roman Island for six years. Every year, before they could uh, revive or reenact the Sobukwe clause, mm. they will visit him with cameras, with journalists, but to date nothing exists. We can't Not even, even in the SABC we, we have no benefit of his voice. And somebody was saying this yeah. thing should be with BBC, etc., etc., etc. But to date, he has been killed long beyond the grave. But mm. so, so some of the gaps that we have picked up that I, I try to concern myself with are about his, his birth. Yes. Uh, who he was. Like Soboko in one of his letters writing from Raban Island, he says that co- contrary to popular belief, I am Musutu, his grandfather came from Kuti, mm. uh, his great-great-grandfather, great came from Kuti and migrated to the Eastern Cape. So he is a Musoto. In the Sutu palace or in the Sutu clan uh, reference, he came oh. And when he went to the Corsa, they started calling him uh, Utlati. Oh, okay. 
Mfayene, but he is, he's returning. His upbringing, his childhood, that formed his character. Christian upbringing, yeah. devout Christian person, his mother, leader of the Maniano, uh, women's guild, yeah. women, his father, devout church person, but also love for books, because they will collect books. His father worked at the local library, all books that were discarded, brought home, and young Sobukwe would, would, would devour these books. Uh, his father was selling coal, uh, and so they were selling uh, wood, and Sobukwe would do uh, ordinary chores as a kid, but spend most of the time reading him together with his brothers and sisters. So the family, the upright family upbringing that yeah. Sobukwe enjoyed uh, in the long run accounted for his character. But he, more than anything is God and the gods endowed him with great and prodigious mind. He had a powerful mm. mind. Where did he source his books? Well, in the local communities, mm. he would go to the local libraries. His father would, uh, was working in the local library. He would spend time there. Yeah. He would uh, be talking to the elders, uh, people who were older than him. He yeah. would be reading in Vozabantu. You yeah. know that there was this proliferation of uh, literature in the Kosa community. Yeah. Uh, in Manyanya, the book by uh, Jordan, A.C. Jordan. A number of texts that were coming up in the newspapers in particular. He, he, he was obsessed with history. His father was a great historian. His grandmother, his mother was a great storyteller. Yeah. So he, they will sit around the fire and his mother will be telling all the stories which he later in life used to a devastating effects in political. In events. political and, 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 his, and in his speeches and in, in his own consciousness. What actually uh, would you say informed his political mind, his political consciousness? So what was the late comment? politics. He started getting involved in politics uh, at Forte. All along he was not. Mm. People tried to coax him to get involved in politics when he arrived at Hilltown. He didn't. Instead, he, he distinguished himself as, a, as an intellectual. Yeah. He was a, 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 a good speaker, eloquent, a good writer. There was a, a local uh, English essay competition, for instance, if I may give you that example quickly, mm. where all the people in the colony then, called the, the, East, the East and the Western Cape, were allowed to enter this competition. It was an in the a, annual essay in, in this competition. Sobuka entered. And when Sobuka's teacher, Mrs. Kelly, realized that Sobuka was one of the contestants, she withdrew her application. <laughs> she didn't want to contest. <laughs> wow. And there was a, a, a teacher there who had a master from Sussex who said, mm-hmm. no, I'm the best English teacher in this area. I'm going to be part of the contest. And when the results came out, the third place went to Reverend Bailey. Mm. of the method of the uh, Anglican diocese in Gramstown. The second position went to the English teacher with a master's from Sussex. Wow. And the first position in the essay competition went to Robert Sobukwe, a, a student who was not even political during that time. Mm. And he, the title of his essay was Masilo's Return. It was a war that was fought between the Corsas and the English, and the Masilo was a hero. And this Masilo, after the Corsa had, had been attacked and defeated, when they went into the forest, they found a white, white woman and a white child. And contrary to the advice of his soldiers, Masilo did not want to kill this white child and this white woman. He brought them into the village, and two days later, he sent them back to the white people who had just defeated them. It's 16 minutes past nine. You're listening to SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. (coughs) We're in conversation with the deputy chairperson of the SABC board, also a participant in the documentary series that we're talking about, uh, Tamika Blagi, talking about the documentary Sobuko, A Great Soul, but talking about the man himself. Uh, The documentary is going to be broadcast on the 20th of March and the 27th of March at 9 p.m. on SABC One. A great feat, as you heard, given that there is isn't a single piece of archive audio recording visual of this man who really was was feared that's one of the interesting things i mean he, the only person that even had a, a clause named after him the subugwa clause where he could be detained um, and renewed every six months this fear of him what do you think it stemmed from <coughs> i'll give you a case in point 1947 uh, uh, at forte the youth league had not been formed at Forte. The Youth League was a reef organization. It was only prevalent in, K- in Johannesburg, Pretoria, etc., etc. Uh, uh, Limbede just died on the 31st of July, and APM died, taking over the leadership of the Youth League. Godfrey Pija was a newcomer as a, a lecturer in anthropology at Forte, mm. and he was under an instruction. A missive was sent out to him that formed a branch of the Youth League at Forte, because without, the capturing, without us capturing Forte, mm. the Youth League's future is going to be at stake. Now, uh, Peter was dispatched and Peter arrived at Forte. Peter could not convince the students at Forte to join the Youth League. Really? Because many other speakers were coming. There was this uh, monthly uh, event where speakers would come and speak and give uh, talks. 
the unity movement came, the communist party came, all organizations came to come to win the minds of the students, but they couldn't until APM Da himself arrived. Mm. And APM Da, as people know, was one of the best minds that this country has ever produced. And APM Da spoke for three hours, precisely because he was informed and told that if you only win the minds and the hearts of Sobukwe, mm. if that student Sobukwe is convinced, all other students at Forte will follow suit. Because oh. of this prodigious mind, I mean, when a book came there by uh, Edward Rooks, <coughs> Time longer than rope. One of the best books that came into the history of this country. First, when it first arrived at Forte, Sobukwe took that book and read it for two days without mm. even going to lunch, dinner, breakfast. He wanted to finish the book. And by the time he finished the book, he went to that class taught by A.C. Sintlok and Native Administration, what we now call Public Administration, and he spoke about the book, informing the teacher, informing the student what the contents of the book were. Now, yeah, you're dealing with a person of a, like I said, the prodigious mind, for candidate of thought, brilliant, but his brilliance was also couched by his humility of character mm. and uprightness of character. Very principled, outspoken, visionary, but down to earth. In the discussion he had with Ganya, he says, you must be as humble as a leader to take the bucket and to go to the river and to fetch water for other men, but still maintain your credibility. Wow. We're going to take calls on 0891104207, 0891104207, SMSs to 34701. Let's take a call from Tabiso in Soweto. Tabiso, good morning. Hi, Siki, how are you? I'm well, thank you. And also greetings there to uh, Kaplaki. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, Tami, I, I, I am... Um, my greatest, you know, uh, theme that I want to take out from Sobuk is politics for me is uh, the question of um, the communist the, the, the role of the, the South African Communist Party in South African politics you know where he predicted that these people they are in South Africa will, we have actually quacks you know and if you look at the history of the Communist Party and the destructiveness that they played in, in the history of, of South Africa starting for instance with the drafting of the Freedom Charter you know where we are told that uh, you know, in Clip Town, the Freedom Charter was representative. Everybody came with documents from all over South Africa. And then we discovered through the writings of David Smith that actually everything that was there, it was stolen, do you understand? And the Freedom Charter was single handedly drafted by Trusty Bernstein, one of the South African Communist Party, a member, a member of the COD, you know. And then you look at the sunset laws that was played out by the Freedom Charter in 19, um, the, the, the South African Communist Party in 1990. And most importantly, uh, like the, the, the persuasion by South, Af- by, by South African Communist Party that uh, actually black South Africans, you are not fighting colonialism as such. You are fighting, you know, apartheid laws, the Fervudian laws, you know. And then Afri- South Africa was taken out from the Organization of African Unity as a country that is colonized. You know, it's an independent country. They just have small problems, you know, until the formation of the PSC through the influence and the writings of people like Robert Sobukwe. So my question is really, um, you know, uh, the, you know the, this destructiveness and the role play with the South African Communist Party and then the prediction that Robert Sobukwe said, you know, what have you to, what have you to say about it? Right. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Tabiso. Simpiwe in East London, good morning. Uh, good morning, ah. Siki, and good morning to Tan. Yes, mm. uh, just one comment I would want to make, perhaps also indulge a little bit on the topic. You know, I've always been fascinated by Robert Marais Having read a little about him, but also having developed an insight and the love of men, whilst I differed with him at the political level to say I didn't espouse views and, and, and politics he, he espoused. But I understood his philosophical basis and Africanism. Simbiwe, 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 your line is terrible. I'm going to put you on hold. We'll see if we can't sort it out. Maybe you need to stand in one spot or stand on one leg or something like that. And we'll take some more calls as well on 0891104207, SMSs to 34701. Maybe you want to speak to what Tabiso was talking about, um, the, the prediction by Sobuko on the role of the, the, the Communist Party. Well, if you look at 1948 until 1958, the the before even the formation of the PAC, the Youth League in particular, the one that was uh, in charge of the branch in particular in Soweto, Orlando, i.e. Pretoria, in the Val, and in some areas of the Islander, Island and Cape Town. These were the branches of the ANC Youth League that were uh, 
desirous to protect their nationalist outlook. They had argued that the ANC was a nationalist movement. It was formed by nationalists. And they were very suspicious of the intrusion of the Communist Party in the ranks of the ANC. Yeah. <coughs> and the charge here in this case was led by a guy called P.K. Leballo, uh, who was very you know, verbose, uh, cantankerous, assertive. Mm. But Sobukwa's take was a bit more intellectual. So because said, this is an intellectual plank that the Communist Party are putting before us. Miles says we disagree with us, but we must engage it. There were those who wanted to dismiss it outrightly. But Lakolbala was very, he, like, typical of a narrow nationalist in this case. But Subuke, more enlightened and more severe, severe in his uh, articulation, mm. he, he saw things differently. That is why he even had great respect for people like J.B. Marx. Mm. Uh, he said, even if I disagree with them, yeah. but I have great respect for these people. As to uh, how the Communist Party played itself out in the long run, I think the jury is still out on that matter. Because even to date, within the ANC, you still have, find this contestation of the so-called Malema quote unquote being referred to as a nationalist, yeah. i.e., these other people. To what an extent is Malema's dilemma as a result of communists now fighting nationalists, etc., etc. So I think these issues of contestation particularly as the manifest within the ANC as a broad church, are still ongoing issues. But he didn't dismiss them. He engaged with them. Well, he engaged with them. He read, he read on them. I mean, when the Communist Party came to present its ideological platform at, uh, at Forte in 1947, Sobuka was one of the students who engaged the leadership that came. When the unity movement led, led by with Fred Tsotsi uh, and Tabata came to the youth, uh, to the Forte, he engaged because these are the students who wanted to read, yeah. who at an earlier age had imbibed all these ideologies in order to find, because during that time they were in search of an ideological home. Yeah. It was only on the arrival of APIMDA when he enunciated the ideological foundations of African nationalism as espoused by APIMDA, as, sorry, as far as espoused by Limbede, that Subuki was convinced of this ideological direction. So if he uh, favoured dialogue and he favoured engagement, why the decision to split from the ANC? This is a very interesting issue that we are raising. Uh, Subukwe, contrary to people, they, these people are not fired from the ANC. They yeah. walked out. They walked out, yeah. They walked out. At the ANC conference that was held in Orlando in, 1940, in 1957, they were in disagreement about the Freedom Charter, mm. among other things. They were saying the Freedom Charter cannot be adopted or ratified. Because during that time, the Freedom Charter had not been ratified in the ranks of the ANC. They were saying, no, it cannot be ratified. We take uh, exception to certain provisions. The land belongs to us. The land cannot belong to all who live in it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a compromise document. But it was only when the, the, also the character of Libalo comes into the equation, when things became physical, when things became personal. Mm. Uh, I remember there was a case in his history point when the Balo had a, a scuffle with Lilian Goy, for instance. A physical scuffle wow. that ensued yeah, at, the, at that uh, Orlando uh, meeting. So the, the, so who can others, because they've been trying to persuade the ANC within their own ranks, they decided to work out. So it was not like they were expelled. They decided to work out to say, uh, f- f- in Sobuka's terms, he says it is difficult to defeat a bureaucracy. You cannot and you would not defeat the bureaucracy. So let us heave out and find our own course. And hence the letter to part ways. Yeah. We have come to a realization that we are parting ways. We are going to inherit the ANC as it was initially contemplated in 1912. We see ourselves as inheritors or progenitors of the original ANC. So it was out of those tensions that had taken place. But contrary to other people say, they were not fired. They walked out in mass to form the new, this new movement. Let's hear again from Simpiwe in East London. <coughs> Simpiwe? Uh, good to be back. Thank you, Siki. Mm. Uh, perhaps let me make concluding remarks. Uh, I'm grateful to, not only to Tami, but also to the SABC for having given a platform for us to be able to reflect on the life and, and times of, of books. Vera really has, in, in terms of for the past 18 or, or 20 or more, or more so years, that we have been able to be given an opportunity have an insight into the other leaders who have characterized the vast experience of, our, of the liberation movement and of the recent history of South Africa. Mm. And it, it's a pity that seeing the history in South Africa has been dominated by, by one party. Unfortunately, I'm a member of that party, and I have always had this concern that why do we want to paint a picture of South Africa as if South Africa was only about the leadership of the African National Congress, notwithstanding the great strides and, and sacrifices its leaders has, has made, but side by side, the sacrifices and strides they have made, they are gallant fighters and heroes and heroes like Sobukwe and, and the rest. And 
our children, not only us, but our children and their children deserve to know about this great little that this country has produced. Thank you, Sweetie. All right. Thanks, Mpiwe. Uh, Vusi in Pretoria. Hi, Vusi. Hi. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, yes, sir. Uh, could you speak to Prof uh, with regards to the issue of race, please? Okay. And uh, and also coupled to the land issue, as it is in South Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Vusi. Um, Balentle in Durban, morning. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, you know, I've always been fascinated by this man, Robert Sabuque, since I went to Robert Robin Island, because it was just absolutely fascinating to me how he had been totally isolated and separated from all the other prisoners. And also the atmosphere in his house was just something absolutely tangible as being... And and the thought that, that came to me when I was standing in there was that this must have been an incredibly powerful individual Mm. who had to be taken away and isolated like that and left on his own and then I think returned to house arrest for the rest of his life as far as I know. Um, Incredibly powerful, um, charismatic, dynamic leader that was just lost to South Africa. I, um, I want you just to repeat, please, Siki, the days that they're going to um, show this the documentary docu- mm. because I'm quite elderly <coughs> and I've already forgotten. Yes, the 20th and the 27th of March. But I, I'm, I'm really pleased mm. and, and, and grateful that this is being done because, as the gentleman says, there's, there's not a lot on him, but he was obviously this giant of a character. Mm. And I'm just fascinated to see this documentary. I'm actually sad that it's only two airings, but I'm going to be very, very happy. What time is that? At 9 p.m. So it's a two-part series. So you've got to watch both. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, and I'll repeat it again. And congratulations to everybody. I think this is a phenomenal project. Thanks, Mbalentle. That's Mbalentle in KZN. Uh, Tamang and Standerton, stay on the line for me, and we'll take more calls. And I'm going to give um, Tamang a chance to to respond to the issues raised um, so far. Um, Vusi wanting you to speak to to the race issue. And in fact, they'd said that um, Sobuko was ahead of his time declaring his commitment to a non racial society in a racist world. Morning talk with Siki Mgabadeli. Siki Mgabadeli. Call 0891-104-207. SMS 34701. In conversation with uh, Tami Kaplaki, Deputy Chairperson of the SABC Board, also a participant in the documentary series Sobuko, A Great Soul. And let me remind you, it's going to be broadcast on the 20th of March and the 27th of March at 9 p.m. on SABC One. It's a two-part series, so the 27th is not a repeat, it's part two. So you've got to watch both, so the 20th and the 27th um, of March. And I think it's fitting uh, that it's on the 20th day before um, a human rights. Uh, day, which of course was the day that the activities in the, the, the developments in Sharpville, Sharpville um, uh, took place. So, a great feat, as uh, we've described, given that in spite of his pivotal role in the struggle for liberation, not a single piece of archive, not a single surviving audio recording of a man who was once one of the most watched, most recorded, most popular political prisoners in the world in his time. We're going to take the call from Tabang and Sanditon because he's been holding on for a little bit longer, and then I'm going to give uh, Tammy a chance to respond to the issues raised. So, Tabang and Stanton, morning. Uh, good morning, Ziki. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, Tammy. How are you? Fine, sir, brother. Um, fine, man. I hope you're enjoying yourself in the SAPC since you've been appointed after joining the ANC. No, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, well, uh, you are talking about the great man, you know, uh, a man who has that uh, the defier of the undefiable. Mm. Uh, the history of Subuku was written in blood, and I don't believe that there are any lies that will ever erase uh, the legacy of Subuku, whatever that the apartheid government has tried, like, for instance, uh, erasing all the archives of Mangali so, uh, and all of the recordings, as they are not available uh, in the modern time. Like, for instance, now, that we'll ever uh, forget about Subuku. But coming on the other issues that uh, Tami talked about them, 
that uh, Busubukwe and the others, they were not expelled from the ANC that they walked out uh, in the Congress. I hope, Tami, you will remember that uh, Tumaganokwe tried uh, to disband the branch of the ANC, of the ANC in Orlando that was being headed by Putla Kulibalo, and eventually Putla Kulibalo was expelled from the ANC. And before that, in the Transvaal Congress, uh, the ANC organized the tax who came with the nook uh, in the in the in the in the in the Congress. And as a result, uh, the Africanists decided to move out in the in the Congress, where Sobukwe pronounced that theirs was a political problem, uh, but. Uh, was a political problem against oppression, nothing else again. And again, as well, in 1958, Bloemfontein Congress, the National Congress of the ANC, uh, the doors were closed against the Africanists, and as a result, they were not able to contest their issues in the Congress. So that's how the PAC came into being as a result. So my brother, may you please do not like distort history. So I will say, well, technically, the Africanists were, 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 were expelled in the in the in the in the ANC and through the influence of the communists. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tabang. That's Tabang and Standards. And I'm going to read SMSs in a moment. Let's read um, some mes- messages on Facebook. And Jangase says, Robert Sobukwe is a giant, a great son of the soil. I will be listening. A liberation struggle that does not restore land to a colonially disp- dispossessed people is a failed liberation. And uh, another one says, yes, we need to talk about, oh, that's Muji, says we need to talk about these legends who are greater than life. Steve Biko is a legend who has certainly not not been given the limelight he deserves. Vusi on Facebook says it is good to notice that at long last the legendary Sobukwe is getting the recognition he deserves. And Wipelo says, Siki, I'm loving the topic about one of our greatest intellectuals this country has ever produced. Some of your um, SMSs, Mohale Khapane says, we are thankful to Tami for the history of our leaders that he is so passionate about uh, to tell it. And uh, Galix and Grundbund says Sobukwe was one of the greatest leaders in Africa Africa. Uh, his spirit will live forever. Uh, Saji Nindenze says, I've been wondering um, when the SABC would do documentaries of other parties like the PAC because it only feeds us about the ANC. Thank you, Tami Gaplaki. And uh, Spiel and Kezren says, what is Tami's comments on the allegations that he alone has uh, destroyed Sobukwe's party, the PAC, when he formed a splinter group, PAM, and deserted it after all? And Sandy Lengidi says, uh, Sobukwe deserves our epic songs and salutes and reverence. And uh, Lazola says, the iconic black leaders of the past must be so disappointed in our current corrupt and competent government. Uh, Sipo in Orlando says, seeing um, that you are now in ANC cater, do you still subscribe to pan-Africanist ideals? And uh, Baseka Makoti says, my presidency will change the colonial Rhodes University to a Robert Sobukwe State Institute. So those being some of your SMSs sent through to 34701. So let's respond uh, to everybody before I take um, any more uh, calls. And Vusi wanted you to talk about uh, the race issue and the land issue. Yes, uh, but, but before that, let me tell you Tabang's matter. Let me just repeat what I've said uh, with emphasis. Uh, Comrade Tabang, the PAC walked out uh, of the ANC conference. There were many reasons. I'm not trying to under downplay the factors that leading to that decision. Uh, the many frustrations that they expressed over the from 1950, from the 1952 defiance campaign, how it was in, inconclusively ended, their quarrel with uh, uh, Dr. Moroka, for instance, having abandoned the course of the ship at a later stage, testifying uh, in mitigation once they've said that we are not going to testify in mitigation. Mm. So the, the, the reasons are ample. We don't have time to go into those details. Suffice it to add that there was there were two groups of so-called hired uh, armies at the ANC conference in 1957, which led to 58, which led to the breakup of the PAC. There was a group called Nsomi Gangs, allegedly from Alexander Township, which was said to have been brought in by some of the leaders of the ANC. There was a group called Marashia, the blanketed uh, people from Lesotho, mm. who were mainly in Mufulo and in some parts of uh, Soweto, who were brought in by Pudla so there was a big standoff because the, the stakes were very high in those mm. conferences. So the same tensions you find in these current conferences of the ANC and other political parties where there's fist fights, where the emotions are high, those tensions were also manifest in the, 16th, in the, in the, in the 
in the 50s. And it became physical. Very yeah. physical. I mean, there were guns. Some people had guns there in those conferences. So I'm not trying to under, downplay those instances, but the, the decision is that the PAC, PAC was not expelled. The PAC, historically, not technical, historical fact, the PAC worked out. And even the letter that they wrote, he said that we have worked out on these reasons. That must be understood. The question of race. There are two dominant philosophical derivations of race, the Christian one and the one by Darwin. Charles Darwin says we've evolved from homo, 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 magne, uh, homo habilis, homo sapiens, homo erectus, etc., etc., and finally we became homo sapiens. The Christians argue that uh, the current trajectory of mankind is distinguished by the three main groups, the Mongoloids, Afro-Noids, and the Caucasians, are as a result of the children of Noah who after the ship had uh, landed when the water had rescinded and they started going to different planets. And because of geographical conditions, then we have the makeup of whiteness, we have the makeup of Asians, we have the makeup of blackness, as a result by uh, influence of material and the geographical conditions. So Booker's view was that regardless of all those input, we are one race. Hence the, the, the common derivation, we come from the human race. In the 50s, when it was fashionable to talk about multiracialism, Soboko insisted that we must speak about non-racialism. He says race has no plural. It has a singular form. So we are people of the same race. We are branches of this different family, but we belong to one universal race, hence the plank of non-racialism, the emphasis of non-racialism. That if I fight a person, I don't fight him because of his race. Mm. I fight him because of his oppressor. We are fighting oppression because when the race changes and oppression still continues, what are we going to do? Yeah. We don't fight people because they are white. A white oppressor can as well be replaced by a black oppressor. What are we going to do? Because mm, one of, the, one of the, the, you know, the perceptions has in the past been that the PAC does not like white people. And uh, that's been, that, 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 that is one thing that the PAC has always said is absolutely untrue. I think all political parties of African people, from Azapo, the ANC and the PAC, speak on one plank in this matter. There's this boogie that was being pandered around the PAC, that the PAC wanted to take white people to the sea. Yeah. The statement that was made in the flare of fury, spare of the moment by Patlako Lubalu, one of the addresses that he made, which was elevated in all the newspapers, the Bantu world in particular, yeah. that the PAC, through Lubalu, says we're going to take white people into the sea. He was radical, as I said, cantankerous, similar vein like uh, Matsunya. Matsunya from Alexander, the, beard, the long beard and coated man, speaking in Johannesburg streets on a day-to-day -day Basis. But it was only when Sobukwe and company came, Sobukwe, Peter Molozi, Peter Raburoko, then they started sanitizing the ideology because the ideology was based on anger. Mm. Uh, the, the epithets, the outspokenness of uh, Matsunya, very scary stuff. These are young people who are very upset and very angry. Remember, the African people had just come from the Second World War. So they were militarized. So they were not mincing their ways. But it was up to Sobukwe to give that content and to shape the ideology and to give it the finesse and the superiority that it later uh, embraced. The land issue? Well, the land issue, in, in no uncertain terms, the first casualty in, in, in Sobukwe's books and in the many other speeches that many, many of these uh, compatriots made, is that the first casualty when white people arrived here was land. Long before the enactment of one single law, the first, first, foremost casualty that we lost was the inhalation of our land. And the struggle must speak to that land question. This, the, we can't subdivide or multiply any commodity unless we have identified the ownership thereof. In this case, the ownership of the land in Africa speaks to the African people. Recently, Connie Mulder came with this twisted logic of history. Uh, Peter. The, P, sorry, Peter Mulder. And if you look at Peter Mulder, Peter Mulder is taken after his father, Connie Mulder, who was disgraced in 1978 in the Info scandal because he had lied to the cabinet, he had lied to the country. Now, his son, so many years later, Peter Mulder, wants to follow the footsteps of his father by blanketly lying about the historical facts of our nation. So Bukwe even indicated in one of his letters from Robin Allen that if I have a big house and you knock into the door, you don't find me in the kitchen, you find me in the bathroom, you can't subsequently claim that the kitchen belongs to you. This whole, this whole house is mine. When white people arrive at a certain particular space in time and found nobody, they cannot therefore legitimately claim that this does not belong to us. African people claim every corner and inch of Africa, irrespective of whether they were there at a particular point in time. But the fact is they never arrived. We never came by ship, we never came by boat, we were indigenous to the African conditions. 
And the same applies to the colored people. There is as a result, they never came. There is a result of miscegenation, a contact between oppressor and African people under certain circumstances. That is why we have the colored people. And they have an equal claim to Africa as Africans. And white people, if they accept how we should go th- do things, non-racialism, stop becoming oppressors, they are as much as willing and accepted to be as Africans. Land reform in its current form? Um, how do you think it, it ties in with the way that Sobuko saw the land question? Well, the, the NUMSA president, Cedric Gina, spoke yesterday. Uh, he's also one of the board members of the SAB. So I was enlightened by his input at the NUMSA conference that one of the things that we must contradict and correct is a sunset clause in the constitution, in the CODESA. Uh, CODESA has big benefits, but at the same time, CODESA trapped us by way of compromise. We, we, we can't compromise and sell out our birthright our birthright to land. And land means not only uh, food, but land means economy. Land means wealth. Land means philosophy. We are one of the people who are well endowed in this country. We have everything from guava to gold, everything from copper to cabbages, everything from uh, potatoes to uh, platinum. We are well endowed, but why are we poor? Why are we now becoming the net importer of foodstuffs in our own country? We are going to starve when up importing chicken from Brazil or Southern America. We can't even produce chicken for our own consumption in this country. Maize, a simple basic diet of the African people. We are importing it simply because land reform is not speaking to agrarian revolution. We need to have revolution, not just reform, agrarian revolution that is going to fundamentally change and alter the landscape of agriculture and the power relation and also create a peasant class have agricultural colleges where people are going to be taught. Everybody else is saying we must do maths and science, but maths is not going to feed us. We need a cadreship of young people who are unemployed in the streets to be sent not only to, to become BEE graduates or want to become get tenders here at left, right, center, but to be involved in the production process. We must learn from countries like China. They are who they are today because of agrarian and rural reform and rural revolution. All right, let's take some calls. Sipo in Orlando West, morning. Morning, morning, uh, CT. Uh, I'd just like to thank Tommy for coming through. Mm. Uh, I wanted to commend him. I'm sure he's the one who influenced the, the documentary. But uh, I also sent an SMS. Uh, you've read it. I wanted to know if he is still uh, subscribed to the ideals of the Pan Africanist uh, movement. Mm. And another thing I wanted to find out the issue of land. Uh, why is it that when Julius raises these questions about land, to be redistributed fairly to the owners of the land, which is the African people? Because we've been robbed of our land. That's a fact. And it seems like uh, white folks are being, you know, nurtured or spoiled in a way. Another question I wanted to ask is about the, the issue of separation. At Robben Island, Sobuke was incarcerated alone, whereas the other guys were in a group form. So what is his take on that? Was it because the guys were selling out already while they were in prison or there was something else? That's something that is. All right. Thanks. Advocate Mantula. Good morning, Sikhi. Good morning, Brother ah. Kami. Yes, uh, Siki, for me, the impact and the legacy of uh, Professor Mangaliso Sobukwe, mm. where I was born, uh, my street was named after him, in fact, in Mabatu, mm. Mafijeng, after the demise of the Bantustan, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. And even at the school that I went, and in my tertiary levels at Vista Suet, we have a building named after Sobukwe. So one will say that we will want to uh, applaud the filmmakers who worked on this archive. But again, to look at the, this eloquence of Robert Sobuk again, that even in Kimberley, he had a close relationship with the Rastafarian community, that I learned that even there when he was banned in Kimberley, he could even represent some of the Rastafarians who were in confrontation with, with the current, uh, with the previous uh, apartheid law system. But finally, it was to look at Brother Tami to say, this is the man who has been celebrated twice in a row, Siki. In February, you'll remember that people will say it is Subuke man. Mm. In March, again, when you look at Shabdi Langa Masaka, you still look around this character of Robert Subuke, but how do we take the teachings of Subuke to the curriculum at lower level until university? Because this was not only a mere political figure, but a great philosopher of the uh, African continent. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Advocate. Uh, Desmond and KZN, morning. Hello, Desmond. Hi, Desmond, yes. Yes, yes, yes. 
actually this great man, you know. I was not here when actually he had a meeting out in Durban. Mm. So the, 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 the people were, very, were highly fascinated. And when he said, hey, I, I'm not actually against the ANC, but uh, what actually is that Ipachi uh, the ANC, as you, see, as you can see, mm. uh, uh, because he was talking about the Group Areas Act. So he said uh, you can see other people when they when they go to to to, to, to the to the business center of Durban, they just walk. Other people have got to travel in in buses and trains to get to Durban. There are other people I remember when we went out of 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 a function at night and say like in YMCA you had to produce a pass because after eleven you you were going to be arrested. So also Bure was treading on those lines, saying that uh, how can you struggle with people that are are free, are not asked for passes at night, are, are, are traveling on foot to get to to West Street mm. and all those things. So he was on Group Areas Act, uh, saying Ipaji ANC ingingingogum yabongage. All right, we'll read some SMSs and uh, see if there's messages on Facebook as well. And I'll give Tammy a chance to respond. We'll do that in a moment. Morning Talk on SAFM. (laughs) SMS 34701. Five minutes to 10, wrapping up our conversation with Tammy Gaplaki, Deputy Chair of the SABC Board, also a participant in the documentary series that we're talking about, uh, Sobugo, A Great Soul. It will be broadcast on the 20th of March and the 27th of March uh, at 9 p.m. on SABC One. It's a two-part series. So part one on the 20th of March, part two on the 27th of March, 9 p.m. on SABC One. And it explores Sobugo's life and provides a platform for his voice to be heard decades after he made his mark and putting his name back on the world map of great liberators. So some SMSs. Here's one. Um, Tammy and I've heard this allegation made in the past. This is from Sam, who says, what was the role of the American embassy in the PAC split from the ANC given the Cold War anti-communism? You want to start with that one? I think there is a book that has come out by one of the American spies or who used to work in the South African context. They used to work with uh, uh, some precadir uh, van der Beek, to be precise, the one that who worked with the coin, uh, Peter Mother's father in 1978, uh, van der Berg. He was in charge of the South African intelligence system. Mm. Uh, this book alleges or makes an, a, a, a case that uh, some of the people in the PAC leadership were infiltrated, i.e., in this case, the, this book singles out Lebalo. Mm. They say that Lebalo also worked in the American embassy. Uh, as an as a, he was like a messenger at yeah. some point, uh, I think after I was expelled as a teacher or something like that. But there is no concrete information in this reg- in this mm. because th- this guy is just casting aspersion on these characters without saying to what an extent if there were people infiltrated. Remember, it was Cold War politics. To what an extent did this uh, spill down or cascade down to the leadership of the of the, of the movement? But I dare want to emphasize the fact that there's just no way in which Obuke could have been an informer of the American system. No Mutopi, no Pokela, no Mlambo, no some of the great leaders who led this movement. Similarly, the same case can be made about the ANC infiltration, the ANC, Azapo, etc., etc. So it was, I, I, I take it that with a pinch of salt. But people must go out and read this book. It's available in also the leading bookstore, bookstores. But second, let me deal with the issue of the Roman Island. So Bukwe was kept in solitary confinement for six years. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't want to agree with the speaker who says other people, because they were not in solitary confinement, they were selling out. I mean, it's nonsensical to say other leaders who were held there, because Mutoping was held there, he was not selling out. Yeah. Mandela was held there, he was not selling out. Pokela, Mlambo, does it mean all of them were selling out? I mean, this is a very shallow uh, argument. But one of the, uh, the bishops would come, because he was Methodist, to give him a uh, sermon or to give him um, tender leg, mm. uh, as it were. In one of the cases, one of the bishops who wrote and subsequently sent his letters through, is that first time he met Sobukwe, he wanted to pray for him. And Sobukwe says, no, let me pray instead. Mm. And this bishop says, uh, this senior person in the church, in the Methodist church, he said, we knelt down. 
But Sobuka was not even allowed to speak to the warders who were giving him food. So it was an opportunity for him looking forward to the arrival of this bishop, mm. a person with whom he's going to confer and have a discussion for the first time. And he said, after kneeling, Sobuka has prayed. And this minister in the Methodist Church says, in all my life, in my 16, 55, 65 years of existence, I've never heard such a powerful prayer. Wow. This was, this, this, this was the, the measure of a man himself. <coughs> he, he was always looking forward to meeting his family. He had difficulties in getting permission to have his children to visit him. And he would write in the letters that we have sourced from Robben Island how he was looking forward with great fondness at the arrival of his family, the arrival of his son, uh, twins, uh, the arrival of his uh, daughter, and the stories that he would tell them. He says, I can't wait. For an, I, I would release an opportunity to have you sitting on my lap and I'll tell you stories as they were told to me by my mother about our nation and where this nation comes from and where this nation should go. Why the isolation? Remember the, the, the foster government passed an act of parliament uh, and they said when they kept so Robert, Robert, when he was supposed to be released in 1963 mm. after having served his three year lawful sentence his family was looking forward the, the press was going there Stan Mujwadi and many other people waiting with anticipation at the arrival of this hero but alas it did not happen and the cabinet met and lone voice by Hel the opposition Helen Sussman notwithstanding that voice the cabinet passed, passed a decision one of the motivators was saying we are going to become our own executioners should we dare release this man we will be our own executioners to quote our, <coughs> our children and our children's children will not forgive us because this man is going to fight white domination. So the lock act was passed yeah. and was kept in solitary confinement uh, for six years and 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 uh, 